Believe it or not, the summer movie season has almost come to an end. What's going on guys, I'm Chris and welcome back to another video. So today I'm going through everything I watched in the month of July. Safe to say it was a slam packed month for me. I watched tons of movies, actual 2023 releases for July, movies that came out years ago, movies that came out this year just not in July, as well as a few TV shows. So it was a busy, busy month for me. I got tons of movies and shows to talk about. Before I get into this thing, be sure to hit that like button, comment down below your favorite movie or show that you watched for the first time in the month of July or rewatched, and subscribe to that notification bell to help reach my goal of 85,000 subscribers here on the channel. It'll mean a lot. Also check out my Patreon link down below. Any support goes a long way. You get access to the Discord server, extra content, all that good stuff. But I say we go ahead and dive right in. So starting with the movies, on July 1st, I watched Insidious Chapter 2 and Insidious Chapter 3. If you guys watched my What I Watched in June video, you would know that I actually started up this franchise and have recently been on a pretty big horror kick. That's going to bleed over a lot into the month of July. In fact, a lot of movies that I watched were exclusively horror films. When it comes to Insidious Chapter 2, it's my second favorite in the franchise. I have a whole ranking of movies linked up above. But Insidious Chapter 2, still James Wan's direction, still eerie, creepy, very good movie. Then you've got Chapter 3, which is a prequel, introducing a new group of characters that I just didn't care about at all. This movie was not it. In fact, I think it's the worst Insidious film. Then on July 2nd, I watched Insidious The Last Key. This is another prequel. And to me, this is the superior prequel. It dives more into Elise's backstory, gives us, you know, more on her life and why she is where she is today. Far from perfect, a very flawed movie, but a step up, in my opinion, from the third film, and actually more of this murder mystery at times. So I found this one more enjoyable and was more entertained by it than the third film. And then I took a day off on July 3rd, and then on the 4th of July, I watched Jaws. This is my annual rewatch, or at least attempt to rewatch this movie annually. This is the ultimate 4th of July movie. It's the ultimate shark movie, and it's a top tier Steven Spielberg movie. It's adventure, it's horror, with John Williams' score, you know, guiding us through it all. It's a perfect film. It's a perfect 5 out of 5, and this was a great little rewatch uh, to do on the 4th of July, because I missed in 2022. On 2021, I showed it to my girlfriend Cam for the first time, video linked up above but really enjoy this film. It's an all-timer for me. Then on July 6th, I started my Nolan rewatch, which didn't really go anywhere. <laughs> I was going to rewatch all the Nolan films before Oppenheimer, and I started that with Following, which is his weakest film in my opinion. It's only like an hour and 10 minutes long, really short watch. You can still see Nolan's directorial flair and like his vision shine through here. Lots of seeds planted in this movie for ideas that would come to fruition in later films. I actually never picked up the Nolan rewatch again. Got busy watching some shows I'll talk about at the end of this video, and then I got on the horror kick, so I was like, I'm just not gonna rewatch the Nolan films. I'm familiar enough with his filmography. I've seen all of his movies multiple times, enough to know what my ranking is, and I felt comfortable talking about them in that ranking video, which again, linked up above. Love. On July 6th as well, I went that night and watched Insidious the Red Door. This movie was a little bit of a disappointment for me. I don't think it's the worst Insidious film, but it could have been so much more. It lacked any of that James Wan feel. Granted, Patrick Wilson's directorial debut had some moments to shine. Some shots in particular felt James Wan, but through and through, the script was really lacking for me here, and it was a lot of movies meshed into one. You've got the family drama of like the breakup of the family on one hand, and on the other hand, you've got Dalton going and figuring out who he is in college at this weird like frat party scene and a lot of things just weren't meshing for me. There were some solid jump scares and I do think it was heartfelt enough at the end but it didn't really leave me satisfied and felt pretty unnecessary by the time the credits rolled. It's also one of the tamest insidious films in terms of being actually scary. That's just my opinion though but I actually didn't watch a movie for 10 straight days after this. In fact the reason I didn't is because my girlfriend had surgery, so I was kind of watching over her and, and taking care of her, but I made a promise to her. I said, when you get surgery, I will finally watch Bridgerton with you. So I'm gonna go ahead and, and veer from the movies. We'll come back to the movies later in this video. I spent four or five days straight binge watching Bridgerton with her. It's one of her favorite shows ever. So I watched Bridgerton season one, Bridgerton season two. Those are both eight episodes, so that's 16 episodes. And then I watched Queen Charlotte, a Bridgerton story, which is about six episodes. Those are on the longer side though. So I spent four or five days watching through the entire Bridgerton universe, if you will. <laughs> By the end of it, I definitely could say I was hooked in. Season two of Bridgerton is my favorite of the bunch, and that focuses on Anthony. Season one is... There's no other way to put it, but season one of this show is ridiculously horny. I mean, there's no other way to say it. I was like, okay, let's wrap this up, because it, it just became less about the main plot and more about people just going at it like bunny rabbits, so... <laughs> 
So I enjoyed Bridgerton season two a lot more. And then you've got Queen Charlotte, which is a nice little prequel origin story for the queen in the Bridgerton show. So I bought into this universe, the mystery behind Lady Whistledown, the drama, the gossip, the intrigue. There's a lot to like with Bridgerton. It's not one of my favorite shows of all time, but I enjoyed my time and I definitely will be watching all the future seasons of Bridgerton that they put out because it's a well-made show. One of the better Netflix original shows in terms of production value. There's some great performances. Season two of Bridgerton is the standout to me, but that's why I didn't watch a movie for like 10 straight days. But coming back to the movie realm, I conquered my fears on July 16th, and I finally watched James Wan's The Conjuring. This is a movie that had sort of haunted me growing up. I had heard so much about it and built it up to be the most terrifying thing ever alongside Insidious, which I conquered Insidious in the month of June. But I finally watched The Conjuring, and it's just such a well-made movie. Very creepy from the start, but it does a good job of establishing Ed and Lorraine Warren's role in society and their relationship while also giving us a backstory on this family that's going to end up getting haunted. It's a creepy as hell movie, some really effective jump scares, and James Wan builds tension from the start, but it's just a very, very good movie. It's in the horror genre, so I'm exploring a lot of horror films with this new style of filmmaking that I've never really been exposed to, and it's refreshing. And that's why I really enjoy horror right now, is because it's all new to me. I've never really given this genre a full chance, so it's been really refreshing. In fact, the more I think about The Conjuring, the more I like it. Patrick Wilson's performance here, I condemn you back to hell, that line chills down my spine. I can't stop thinking about this movie. It grows on me the more and more I let it sit. But then on July 17th, I watched Haunted Mansion at an early screening. Nothing special by any means, far from perfect. Definitely a bit of a jumbled start with some jarring and even choppy editing at times, sort of cutting off scenes too soon, leaving me a little confused, honestly. But the movie's funny, it's got a lot of heart, and Lakeith Stanfield's performance is outstanding. One scene in particular, I was like, wow, this movie's really striking a chord with me emotionally. Owen Wilson's funny as hell, in fact, the humor in this movie surprised me through and through. And I actually have a review of the movie linked up above if you guys want my full in-depth thoughts. But then on July 18th, I watched Barbie, and on July 20th, I watched Oppenheimer. This was part one, a little preview of the Barbenheimer double feature that I'm gonna talk about later in this video. When it comes down to Barbie, it's a really well-made movie. It's hilarious at times. It's got an important message that people need to hear. I didn't love the movie like I wanted to. It feels like a lot of tones clashing at times. It gets to the point of beating the audience over the head with the main message where it was a little more clever in the first act. But overall, I had a good time with Barbie. Then on the 20th, I watched Oppenheimer and was blown away. I saw the film in IMAX, not 70 millimeter IMAX, unfortunately, just regular IMAX, but it was still so immersive and this is a movie that has not escaped my mind since I've watched it. It is brilliant. Christopher Nolan brought his A-game yet again. It's the culmination of all the things I love about him as a filmmaker featuring Ludwig Göransson's score, which is outstanding. Have not stopped listening to that on Spotify, actually. Then you've got the fact that Killian Murphy brings his A-game, RDJ brings his A-game, Emily Blunt brings her A-game. Oscars across the board for not only the performances, but the technical aspects of this film, the directing of this film. It is an achievement, in my opinion, in filmmaking, and a movie that will resonate with me for years to come. So much much so that I want to see it a third time again, hopefully maybe in 70mm IMAX, but I checked and the theater near me that has it has been sold out for a while, so that's a bummer, but maybe I'll get to see it if they extend it. You never know. Then on the 21st, I watched The Conjuring 2. James Wan also directed this film, and I'll say this much, I think it's arguably scarier than the first Conjuring. I think The Conjuring 1 is a better movie, but The Conjuring 2 creates a sense of terror that's almost more powerful than the first film. The introduction of the nun here, horrifying, and then the way they shoot the demons in the actual house that's being haunted in this film, bone chilling stuff. It's too long for its own good, which is my one knock at the movie. It doesn't need to be over two hours long. You can kind of feel that runtime. But what I really appreciate about The Conjuring 2 is Ed and Lorena's characters. Anytime they're on screen, they just carry a scene. It doesn't even have to be a horror scene. We can just see Ed being like a great father figure and it warms my heart. They're very likable characters and they're the anchor of these Conjuring films. But then on July 22nd, I did my Barbenheimer double feature with my friend. Friends. I actually have a podcast with my girlfriend, The Unusual Couple Podcast. Link that up above and down below. I shall. I don't know why I talked like Yoda there. But if you guys want like the full recap of my day, Barbenheimer, you can check that out down there. It was a lot of fun. We made a whole day out of it, went out to eat, did the double feature, and Oppenheimer. 
saw it in Dolby and it literally blew my socks off. It was so loud, my seat was rattling at times. And then Barbie on round two, a lot of fun as well. So if you want the full in-depth behind the scenes look at that day, check out the most recent episode of the Unusual Couple Podcast and go subscribe to that channel. We're trying to reach a thousand subscribers over there, so that would mean a lot. Then on the 23rd, I took my girlfriend to see Mission Impossible Dead Ranking Part 1 because she had not seen it yet. When it came out, she was recovering from a surgery, so she just didn't get around to it. I saw it on an early screening, so I went and took her. We both had a lot of fun. It's still one of the better movies of the year. Tom Cruise, I mean, come on, he's fully committed and the third act of this movie kicks ass. The rest of it can be a little bit of a drag at times, but there's still a really engaging main narrative and the third act with the train kicks ass. Like that is the most memorable part of this movie for sure. And I think part two is actually gonna top part one whenever that does end up coming out. That same night though, I went and watched The Conjuring, The Devil Made Me Do It, the third Conjuring film, and was super disappointed. This was a really mad movie. The more I think about it, the less I like it, which is the opposite of how I feel about the first Conjuring movie. Um, but the reason this movie fails is because the main storyline is so stupid. It feels so watered down compared to the other two Conjuring films. James Wan's direction is sorely missing here. There's not any distinct style or flair. It just feels like some generic horror movie, and that's the case with both The Conjuring and the Insidious franchise, once James Wan steps away from the director's chair, the quality of these franchises dips, unfortunately, and that's the case with The Devil Made Me Do It, one of the more disappointing experiences I've had with a movie in a while, actually. Then I rolled around on July 25th and watched Malignant. This is another James Wan film, and I enjoyed it. I think it gets a little wacky at times and inexplicably stupid, like, uh, it really doesn't make sense, not even with the crazy rules they set up in the universe, how certain entity gets defeated at one point. I was just like, this is uh, almost too cheesy, and I checked out a little bit. But the mystery created uh, throughout this film, the jump scares, the transitions, like the way they're shot, it's beautiful, and it's fully James Wan's movie. Like, he committed to this, and I respect him for that. I'm glad he got to make the movie that he wanted to make. I didn't love it like I wanted to, but it's still really solid, and I honestly would watch it again. Then on July July 27th, I went to the theater to watch Talk To Me. This is the new A24 horror film. This movie is one of, if not the most disturbing films I've ever seen. I was in the theater alone, like there were other people in the theater, but I went alone and I had to like grab my drink in my, in my cup holder, like comfort me at times and even look away. I was wincing, biting my nails. It's a very disturbing movie, very creepy movie. And I have a lot more to say in my review, which you guys check out linked up above, but it's one of the better movies of the year, I would say. It's in my top 10 as it stands right now. And then on July 29th, I watched Dungeons and Dragons, finally. I know a lot of you guys in the live streams or in comments have been begging me to watch D&D. Well, I finally checked this movie out and it was delightful. It is such a blast. Great blend of the fantasy adventure vibes with the comedy. Chris Pine further solidifies why he might just be the best Chris in Hollywood right now. Uh, the cast all around had great chemistry. It's a fun movie and surprisingly heartfelt. Like in the final moments of this movie, the final act I should say, really pulled on the heartstrings. Damn near brought me to tears. Did not expect that from a D&D &D movie. So all you guys were right, this movie does rule and it's one of the biggest surprises of the year. Alongside Blackberry, which is another movie that I watched on the night of July 29th, this movie totally blew me away. This is a top five movie of the year, I'm willing to say. And if you like The Social Network and Steve Jobs, it's almost like this weird love child between the two films. Though it's not written by Aaron Sorkin, surprisingly, it still kicks ass. This movie features outstanding performances. Jay Baruchel brings it, but the real standout here is Glenn Howerton in this movie. He plays Dennis in It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. Once I was able to look past that, I was able to really embrace the greatness that this man delivered on screen. He is incredible, there's no other way to put it. I still have chills thinking about some of his scenes here, but I love movies like this where it's sort of this corporate story of the rise and fall of a tech company or a company in general. Much like, you know, The Wolf of Wall Street, it's like, oh, we get, you know, really high in life and success and all this, and then it all crashes down just as fast as it was built up. This is definitely one of those stories we see characters change throughout the film, but the direction is just so engaging. There's constant zooms in characters' faces, and it's such a engrossing, movie from the start. I was fascinated with the subject matter because I didn't really know too much about Blackberries except for the fact that my dad had one for work like in the early 2000s and it's crazy how they fell off so fast. This is a great movie. If you're a fan of these biopics about companies and, and the corporate side of things, like I mentioned, 
Steve Jobs, The Social Network. This is right up your alley, and um, I'm so glad that I gave this one a chance. It's one of the stronger movies of 2023. In fact, I would love if it's got some Oscars consideration. I don't think that's going to be the case because it's from a bit of a smaller studio, but it would be really cool if this got nominated for like screenplay or even Glenn Howerton for supporting actor. But those are all the movies that I watched this month. So as for TV, I already talked about how I watched all the Bridgerton universe, but I have to mention The Bear Season 2. This is my favorite TV show of the year so far. I watched The Bear last summer when it came out. Then I rewatched it this summer twice, once by myself, once with my girlfriend, and then I watched season two and was blown away. This is my favorite show of the year, like I mentioned. It's able to just portray the chaotic nature of this restaurant, but season two dives more into the supporting cast, whether that be Marcus, Sydney, or most importantly, Richie, one of the characters who's been a bit of a prick in the show before, finally gets his time to shine here. They fully flesh out his backstory. The sixth episode and the seventh episode of season two are some of the best episodes of TV I've seen in quite some time. And the sixth episode features a star-studded cast, John Bernthal, Bob Odenkirk. I won't spoil some of the other reveals, but man, oh man, is this a loaded cast and one of the best portrayals of a dysfunctional family I may have ever seen. The Bear season two is amazing. We need season three to get greenlit because I hope the show doesn't end on the note that it does. I still liked the finale, but I would love, you know, for a third season and maybe even a fourth. Keep the show going because I really love it. And the last thing I'm going to talk about in this video is Secret Invasion, which if you guys have followed me for a while now, I got the first two episodes early and I did a review of those back in June now, I want to say. And I didn't watch any of them until the, the day the finale dropped. I waited because I was going to binge it all. So I watched recaps of the first two episodes just to refresh myself. And then I watched all four episodes, you know, episodes three, four, five, six, back to back to back to back. And I was pretty underwhelmed. It was amazing to me how so so much was set up in the first two episodes, and then by the finale, the show failed to really progress anything forward that much. It felt rushed, it didn't really come to a satisfying conclusion with a lot of major plot points that were set up, and it became a bit ridiculous in the final episode with certain characters almost getting insane powers. It was really weird, and I don't understand the decision making behind the scenes. The whole thing was pretty unmemorable, which feels like the case with a lot of MTU Disney Plus shows, and it stinks because I, again, the, in the first two episodes, I was like, this has the potential to be great. It, it, feels like Spy, like Mission Impossible, like the early films in particular. It was really intriguing and it just lost me along the way, um, making it one of the least memorable MCU Disney Plus shows, unfortunately. But yeah, that's everything that I watched in the month of July from all the movies to TV shows. If you guys want to see my reviews of all the movies I talked about, you can follow me on Letterboxd, the link down below. It's at Filmstock. My name will pop up. Subscribe to that notification bell to help reach my goal of 85,000 subscribers here on the channel. Check out my Patreon link down below for extra content, including the Discord server, access to early videos, all that good stuff. But that'll do it for this video, and until next time, we'll see you guys later. <laughs>